the drive. Tatum the finish. It is Banner 18. The mission commanding. It's mission accomplished. What's up, everyone? This is Noah Dalzell, and we're here with another episode of You Got Boston. And I'm here with my former coworker, former uh, <laughs> Jack Simone, who is now with Harvey PD, previously at Celtics Blog. Is that, that that's out, right? That's public public knowledge. Harvey PD, yeah, yeah. I've worked there for a month. Yeah, it's public knowledge. Harvey PD, yeah. <laughs> yeah I think you do a big a big announcement. You know, I did it on Twitter. You know me. I, I always do my Twitter. big announcement. No, you, you stuck it in there. Um, but I'm not I'm not a social media guy. I leave that to the professionals like you. I'm I'm not I'm not built like that. <laughs> I know. Um, well, we have a couple of things we're going to talk about today. I wanted to give share a little bit of an update from the event in Rhode Island earlier this week with Joe Missoula. Um, not not too in depth because Bobby Bob Manning and I already did a stand up on that one, but um, just to give you guys some context, it was pretty cool. Joe was in at the Rhode Island State Capitol. Um, celebrating the championship parade. I wrote a story about that for Celtics Law. You can check that out. Um, for me, it was personally cool because I used to lobby at the Rhode Island State Capitol um, because for some of you know, I was previously a full-time lobbyist and now I do this full-time, which is fun. Um, so it was cool. I recognized a lot of like the legislators in the crowd, um, but I was like, I hope that we don't have to talk. So it's not, um, it doesn't feel like <laughs> I'm like too, too mixed up with everything, but it was a very cool event, beautiful day. And Joe just seemed really, really happy to be able to celebrate this championship alongside his family and friends in Rhode Island. I talked to his aunt, his cousin. Um, they were really funny and like really cool. Like I was like <laughs> hanging out with his aunt and his cousin and I was like, I would be friends with this girl like in real life. So um, it was definitely a cool event. We didn't get to talk to him, but he he did speak to the crowd and just shared like how meaningful it was because he was really raised by the Rhode Island community um, and all of that. And then Joe also did, I'll just plug, he did a one-on-one -on -one interview with uh, John Corrales at Locked On Celtics, which some of you might know is my all-time favorite Celtics podcast. So um, no offense, no offense, Jack. Um, <laughs> but, fine. I get it. No, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, it's you know, fine. It's, I get it's, it. it's, you know how I feel about it. So, um, so yeah, check that out as well. Those are my two plugs. Uh, but I have Jack here today because we're going to do a little Celtics season preview, but award style, um, because I think that, as you all know, this is as dead as it gets as far as the Celtics offseason season. We really did have like a lot going on for a while there between the yeah. finals and then right to the draft. That, that turnaround, I really didn't like. I feel like that was way too quick. Um, mm -hmm. To the point where like I'm the first to admit I did not have enough time to research those guys. Um, and then right to Summer League, which we were both at, and, and that was a cool experience to get to know some of those players. Um, and then right from there to the Olympics. And so that was, you know, all the narratives that came with that. So there really hasn't been a slow moment but between now and the 24th, 22nd, 24th. Yeah, it's been pretty dead for like the last week or two. Like there's just been nothing going on after the Olympics. And I mean, it's kind of nice because like I feel like for the first few days, you're like, oh, now I get to breathe a little bit. Then you're like, I just I just want to watch and talk about basketball again. Like I'm over it already. Like it's such a quick I just needed a week and then bring the season back. But now we've got like another I mean, training camp starts up soon enough. So I guess that'll give some some entertainment. But we still got like over a month and a half at least until regular season basketball which not fun i i need it i need it now i need it very very quickly i know i am excited for training camp especially because now there's like the lonnie walker story um <laughs> which by now you've probably you know those of you that follow clns and just follow Celtics media in general you've probably seen 25 lonnie yep. walker podcasts so <laughs> i can't i don't even think we should talk about lonnie walker because that's been that has been heavily discussed. And honestly, I think it's a little bit of a mystery, like why he's in this position. And we're all kind of speculating, but we'll probably get a better sense in the next few weeks. Like if there's something about him that has made teams want to pass up on him or what I maintain, I think he might've just played his cards wrong the same way that like O'Shea Brissett might have as well, um, where you maybe just didn't make the right mm -hmm. moves earlier in the off season. And now you're in a predicament in September. Um, who knows? I don't know. Yeah, is that your I mean, take or do you have a different perspective on it? <sighs> I, I think Lonnie Walker is fine. I don't think he's a great fit on the Celtics in particular. Like, I just don't know. Like everyone's talking about, Oh, he's this great shooter. But like the Celtics already have shooters and you can't have enough shooting, but everyone's taking like, I mean, our comment section, the first day when it happened, it's like, Oh, they can trade Pritchard down. I'm like guys, like let's, I, I, I get it. I get getting excited for somebody that they just signed, but it, it almost feels like to me, like as much as it could be like a, like a Dennis Schroeder or a Shaper set, like they just waited too long in the money dried up situation for Lonnie Walker. Like there's also a reason that other guys got chosen over him at the end of the day. And so I think yeah. he could contribute 
but I guess I'm not as high on him as some other people are. I know you're pretty high on Lonnie Walker and, and we've had discussions about it, but I, I I'd love for it to work out. I think there's a chance Lonnie, like I, I think the ceiling is, is great with Lonnie Walker. I think he could score. Obviously I think he's a good shooter. I think he could do all that stuff with the bench of the Celtics. But if you're Boston, you're going to play Pritchard over him. You're going to play Hauser over him. You're going to play all these guys over him. And you don't really like at the end of the day, like, there were all these rumblings at the trade deadline last year, like, oh, they could be interested in Lenny Walker, blah, blah, blah. And then they traded for Springer. And Sam and I talked about this on How About Them Celtics. He's like, well, there's a reason they doubled back. And I was like, well, what if they chose Springer over him? Like, what if it wasn't, oh, we couldn't get a deal done? What if it was, we could have Lonnie Walker or Jaden Springer? And they're like, oh, we like the upside of yeah. Springer, Lonnie Walker. So it just, I think it'd be cool. I think it's going to be very in- interesting to see uh, how he does in the preseason. And I, I think the chances of him making the roster wholly depends on how well he plays during the preseason and training camp and how well I can fit in with the roster. Me too. Cause it's like <laughs> all, all eyes. This, he has more eyes on him than any training camp player in the NBA right now. A hundred percent. Which is so wild. It's also especially because there's going to be, there's nobody new for us to watch at training no. camp. Like Porzingis won't be playing. So there's not going to be that. Plus I think fans have relaxed a little bit on him. Like they know it's going to be a little while. There was a moment in time there where yeah. I feel like every practice and shoot around that we showed up to, it was just, can you see Porzingis? Is he in the room? Like, is yeah. he crossing the, is he on his phone walking by the gym? You know, it was like, that's all everybody <laughs> cared about. And I feel like that's going to be set aside for a bit. And then other than that, it's like going to be the same old guys. I know there's going to be stuff around the Olympics for sure. There's going to be questions around that, but I don't think it's going to last that long because like, how much can you talk about it? You know, I hope um, not. after the first, every, all the main guys are going to get a question about it. I mean, some of them have already been asked about it, like off offline, like in other places, like mm. the crowds and podcast and, uh, Drew Holiday was asked about it at that Raising Canes event that we were at. And so there's certain people have talked about it, but there's going to be like Jalen Brown's going to, he's going to have a lot to talk about. But Jalen Brown, just in general, like his summer, that's going to be a whole thing. He's been um, everywhere. Everything that he's done, the rap career, the Twitter hacking that he still hasn't figured out. <laughs> um, and so he's been busy. Um, but yeah, Lonnie Walker will be, will be the story, I think, just because he's really one of the only fresh faces. Um, and plus like the summer league guys that we had at summer league. So like, we, I mean, how many times have we talked to like Baylor Shireman and Anton Watson in like a two week yeah. period? You know, so he'll be the he'll be the main event, which is funny to say considering it's a championship team mm-hmm. and he's on an exhibit ten. Um, but yeah, so what we're gonna do today is go through like Celtics awards. So naming who we predict, each of us predict will be the MVP next year, the most improved player next year, the sixth man of the year, defensive player of the year, and clutch player of the year. And that's just for the Celtics. So. Like we're going to pick from the guys that are currently under contract next year. Um, and we'll see if we, Jack and I haven't talked about our selections yet. So we'll see if we agree. I hope we disagree on some of these. We haven't had a good old fashioned argument in like <laughs> you know, a few solid weeks, you know? Um, so yeah. I would be, I'd be happy to argue about something. Um, yeah, we'll see. So I'm trying to think maybe we should start. Let's do MVP last. Okay. Um, even though I have a feeling we have the same person for this. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Um, but, but let's see. do okay. Let's start with Clutch Player of the Year because that's the most like and big. Like, I didn't even remember this was an award initially. What is this like? This is like the third year that they've done Clutch Player of the Year, right? Yeah, who's Darren won Fox, it? Steph Curry? That's it, I think. I, yeah, I think it's just been two. What a wild first two winners too. Like obviously Curry makes sense, but Darren Fox winning, but the Darren inaugural really Clutch Player of the like Year. That year, yeah. And then I know. Last year he he did like didn't have anything clutch about him. I don't yeah. think so. <laughs> it's um, weird. So Clutch Player of the Year to me this one was a no brainer. Um, I'll let you say first. See, so I I was originally going to say Jalen Brown. I was going to say Jalen for my answer at first. And then you said something that like triggered another thought process that has me debating changing my answer. You were like, oh, Darren Fox was only clutch that year and he didn't do much last year. Because like realistically, it is so like being the clutch player is so predicated on getting the shots, like getting the clutch shots and making them right. Like, like. Jason Tatum could take 10 clutch shots and make one and nobody thinks about it. Derek White could get three, never. make two, well, make two. And like, then he's the clutch player. You know what I'm saying? So it's so, it turns out I'm going to go Jalen though. I, I think during the playoffs, you really saw it for JB. Like a lot of those games in the Pacer series and the Mavs series in particular, like they get to the end of the game and it's close, whether or not it should be close, like whether or not the Celtics blew lead or whatever, like you see him hitting these big time mid range shots, uh, even in the regular season last year, like he got one chance. I think he didn't get many clutch shot opportunities because Tatum got most of them. Uh, and the one was like the Pacers one where buddy healed hit him on the head and they called nothing, blah, blah, blah. Obviously he hit the clutchest shot of the season, arguably uh, in 
the conference finals against the Pacers. So it, it just makes sense to me. I, I feel like he's one of the better shot makers in the league, like tough shot makers at this point. Um, and I think after what you saw in the, in the finals, not only should the Celtics be more comfortable letting JB take some of the shots, but I think Tatum should be too, because it's clear that he can. And I feel like at the end of the day, he might be better suited to hit those types of shots than Tatum is anyways. Yeah, I think that's a great pick. And it was funny when you just said he hit the clutch shot of the year. I actually had a different shot mm. in mind than the one you said. Um, I mm. had the one in game three in the finals where they were totally losing the yeah. composure. That's the one where Deuce afterwards in the locker room was like, we almost lost. We almost lost. I remember sitting there. I can't remember. I don't think we were sitting next to each other that game, but I was sitting there being like, where they was on the brink of like, if they go up 3-0, they're, they're winning the championship pretty much. Um, two, if they lose this game now, they're one game away from it being tied. And Tie. we've seen plenty of teams come back from being down 2-0. I felt like those two minutes at the end of that game three, really like, their legacies were really cemented there. And I remember seeing post game, like Jason Tatum and Joan Brown walk out and you could just see like they had won the championship. Um, and that's why game four, I felt like was a little over overreacted, but he had that, it was like a, like a mid range shot. Uh, and there was like, there was like a minute to go, but they just couldn't score. Yeah. Like they were just turning the ball over and nothing was going in. And then he kind of stopped the bleeding there. So he had, I would say like this past playoff run, like he was the no brainer pick. Um, I have a different pick though for clutch player of the year for next year. Uh, and it's not Jalen Brown and it's not Jason Tatum. It's Derek White. And I think Derek White's the one like hang up that I had when making that pick was the fact that he just doesn't get as many looks down the stretch, like down by one with 30 seconds to go. Is he going to get the the play? Like, I don't think they're going to run things for him, but I think we've seen now that both Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are comfortable passing out in those moments and increasingly yeah. so. And there was, like the game that they won the Eastern Conference Finals, like Derek White is one that hit the three there. Throughout the entire season, it felt like every time there was a big three-pointer, um, Derek White nailed it, right? And I, I don't know what his stat ended up being at the end of the year, but there was a point where he was hitting like 60% of his three-pointers in clutch time on the NBA season. Um, and so I, I feel like that's going to continue. Even then in the Olympics, I felt like when he checked in, like, I mean, just showing up on the Olympic team, having not been there for training camp, coming in and like hitting your first couple three-pointers, like he just has something about him where – he just stays so steady and, and the defense can't overreact to him because there's just too much talent on the roster. So he's my pick, but it was a close one because I think Jalen Brown earned it from his play last year. Um, mm-hmm. I just think Derek has, a, we have a big sample size of just how clutch he is in those moments. Yeah. Derek White hit. I have the stat here. Just reset. Uh, 12 of 23 from three in the clutch in the regular season. So he was definitely, definitely pretty clutch yeah. in those moments. And he was the guy I was going back and forth on when I had like my dilemma before I said Jalen Brown. And it was because of the Raptors games. He had like the same exact three point shot against the Raptors twice to like bury them. Um, I, know. I forget who passed it to him, but it was like identical shots, identical timing, identical situations. And he just buried the Raptors both times so I, I think that's a good pick i think tatum obviously could be it too just because of the volume and like realistically if he makes like three of those shots it's a completely different narrative around him but he didn't last year and so i'm gonna i'm gonna say, i think jalen is the safer pick after what we saw in the, in the playoffs yeah that, that would be a tough pick to make that would be like i'm looking into the horoscope and i think bounce like, back yeah <laughs> yeah because we, we didn't see that last year no. um what we did see is in the playoffs an increasing willingness to not settle for that shot mm-hmm. that we all hate the double team fade away, you know, running the clock down. Like he, we didn't Mid-range. see much of that in the playoffs. And I feel like there was a narrative all, all season that the Celtics can't win during the regular season. Um, and then obviously in the playoffs, sorry, the Celtics can't win clutch games in the regular season. And that was like the big thing that we were all concerned about. I mean, that was really my only hangup on this team was like, what happens when it's a close game down the stretch? And then they literally won every single close game throughout the playoffs. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, w- wouldn't have been able to predict it, but it wasn't because Alpha and Tatum turned into like a clutch shot maker. It was more because no. everybody else, you know, he was willing to give it up to other people and they were always finding the right shot, whether it was Al Horford or whether it was Jalen or whatever it was. Um, so, so yeah, but those are those are two good picks and we're going to hear from our friends over at, at Price Picks. Price Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. Uh, Price Picks is the easiest way to play daily fantasy sports unlike other apps on prize picks it's just you against the numbers all you have to do is pick more or less on two to six player stats projections and watch the winnings roll in you can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks prize picks is the best way to get action on sports in most states including california texas and georgia uh, prize picks is the only real money daily fantasy platform with an injury insurance policy 
uh, so that your lineup stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured, if your player leaves in the first half and doesn't return, prize picks, your picks are still alive. Um, so right now, if you're watching games, if you're watching basketball, different sports, the injury insurance thing, that could be a lot of fun. That has already benefited me in the past as well. So download the prize picks app today and use code CLNS and get $50 instantly when you play $5. That's code CLNS on prize picks to get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize picks run your game. So let's go to defensive player of the year as the next pick. Um, I think... This one is this one is actually really tough for me because I feel like whenever I think yeah. about Celtics defense, there's like there's a couple of different ways you could look at it. But again, I'll let you go first. I already have my my mind solidified. I'm not going to be persuaded. <laughs> yeah, it this is this is hard because these play the Celtics play such a team oriented style of defense, and it's not like like Rudy Gobert's Jazz teams. He won Defensive Player of the Year because those Jazz teams were not good at defense, but he was such a force inside that he changed everything. Um, the same can be said for like, you know, a million other defense players. The Celtics team's not that, right? They have good defenders up and down the roster. So it's realistically just going to come down to like who makes the most big plays, kind of who shuts down the most stars on any given night, blah, 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 stuff like that. And Porzingis is out. I think Horford's actually going to be a lot more important than people realize. Same with like Tillman and them, but I don't think it's as big of a role to the point where you could give him this award. I feel like it's so obvious for me as the Derek White guy to do it, but I'm going to do it anyways. I'm just going to pick Derek White because it's Derek White, right? Like he he is one of the most, I think one of the most unique defenders in the league from the perspective of like, he's so good at guarding bigs as a skinny guard. Um, he, you know, has perfected the the chase down block from behind uh, in the half court. Um, the way he stays in front of guys, uh, smaller guards in the perimeter, I think is really impressive. I think Drew Holiday, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum even would be awesome picks as well. But I'm going to go Derek White. I just think he could end up having the most big time plays and big time moments um, for the Celtics this year. And I think he's going to be in route to another all defensive team. It's a good pick. Um, I went with Drew Holiday. I, I think yeah. the, for me, the three selections and, and and beyond just like just this exercise of thinking about next year, I generally when I think about like the Celtics deserve some players on the all defense team, like who are those players? And obviously, Jalen Brown really wanted to be on that team and he wasn't. And at the time, I was like, okay, if you look at his like all around defense, consider you know night in and night out. Like I get why he wasn't one of the ten guys that were selected. Like he does make mistakes. He's not as good of an off ball team defender. But then when you see in the finals, like what he did to Luca and what he did just throughout the finals, throughout the playoffs, when he would just match up with someone and really take them out of their element, like it's like he's really the only guy in the roster that could do that. You know, to that level with his size and with his athleticism. Um, and also just like he's like really in his prime of his, of all that. So he was a tempting selection, but I went with Drew because I think when you think about his value from a team perspective, I don't know that any one player has as big of a team defensive uh, impact. And so it's tough because Derek gets like most of the highlight plays. I think Jalen gets like the tough one on one matchups just because he is like guard. You know, he's in the position that usually the best NBA players are like the the forward type players mm. that are a little bit longer, a little bit taller, but. I still think Drew has the edge just because of what he's able to do and just the way that he's able to correct other people's mistakes. Um, and there's so often where you see somebody cheats or somebody like goes back for it and, and Drew just like fixes that. And I feel like from a basketball player standpoint, like whenever I play basketball, I start to think about it more through that lens because I'm thinking like, hey, people don't even really realize but this person just cleaned up like four people's mess. And I feel like that doesn't show up on the statute as much. It's not going to get as much credit. Um, and then, I mean, there's moments where he does, like when he got that steal on, you know, Aaron Neesmith and to secure was like game three, I believe. Uh, like he does have those plays, but ultimately I think he doesn't have as much of them, but he was my pick, but I, I, I was tempted to say Jalen Brown just because I feel like being able to do what he does one-on-one, -on -one, it, it changes the game. Um, yeah. And then obviously Derek too, it's a tough one, but I'll go through. I think ironically, I was between Derek White and Jason Tatum for my pick, as you were between Jalen Brown and Drew Holiday for your pick. And everyone's, I feel like most people would be like, why Jason Tatum? Blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah. The reason why is because the Cavs series in the Eastern Conference semifinals, because that protection, I'm not saying close, but like when Al Horford was on the bench and when they were running Jason Tatum at center, basically, he was just going to switch on to Evan Mobley. He was coming over to switch from the corner and playing rim protector role. Like he can do it. He's six, nine, right? long arms, like lengthy defender. I'm not saying he's going to get down there and bang down low with Embiid and Jokic and them. Like he's just not, he, he's not built like that. Not nobody is, but I think you're going to see Jason Tatum tap into a more versatile defensive 
I don't know what the role this season with Porzingis out, um, especially considering now he knows Jalen and, and Derek and Drew like are fully capable of contributing to yeah. the offense, winning a championship. I feel like he could tap into that a bit more this year. So um, I, I'm I'm very high on Tatum's defensive ceiling this year, but I still think Derek White is going to get a lot of those highlight plays in, in terms of like game winning, game impacting situations throughout the year more consistently than Tatum will. That's a good point. I, I guess the thing is, I'm, I'm, I was thinking about it a little too much in the frame of like who's currently the defensive player of the year because I didn't, I didn't think there was going to be that much change. But I guess there is room for like someone to make a leap. Like Joan Brown yeah. made a huge leap on the defensive end this year. I don't know that Tatum did as much con- considering his career. I feel like he was probably better than he was in years prior. But Jalen Brown made a more noticeable leap. Maybe he yes. two for one. Uh, yes, I agree. But we'll see. And especially, I mean, we'll see about the shooting thing. But if the shooting struggles continue, like. He's going to have to make up for it in other places. You better tap into that defense, buddy, if, if that's going to keep up. I will I say it is it is crazy that we discussed Defensive Player of the Year and we had four different even potential options. Like, that's just a testament to how good the Celtics are. I feel like for this whole award series, the fact that there are so many good options for each of these, yeah. it does kind of highlight, like, for some of its, for some teams, it would be really obvious. Like, this is the MVP. This is the obvious sixth man. Mm. You know, I actually didn't feel like any of these selections were super straightforward to me. Um, yeah. But let's go to sixth man of the year. Um, should I just let keep letting you go first? I kind of like this, I, this flow. I, I think I'm going to steal your thunder. So I feel like maybe you go first for this one. Cause I, I might, I worry I, I could steal your thunder. You. Okay. Well, do you want me to go thunder. first then? Okay. Never mind. Okay. And that's not who you had. I know. No, I never think some of It was a close one, but I think that Sam Hauser has made a big leap in the past year, but I actually think he's about to make another massive leap um, mm. just because we started seeing just more from him offensively, but but very small glimpses. So like, I don't think it's really come to fruition yet, um, but I could see him being a double figure scorer off the bench. Um, and I don't know that I could see Pritchard being that. And a lot of times sixth man of the year kind of gets a little bit dumbed down to that. So Pritchard will always be the guy, at least like for right now, Maybe not always, but he'll be, he is the guy that runs the show and, and really kind of manages that second unit. Um, but I don't know that he's always the guy that's going to receive the most credit for it or the most points. Um, and I think Sam Hauser is gonna, has the ability, it has the potential to really like produce a lot this year, um, especially because he's shown that he can stay on the court during big moments. Like in the finals, Pritchard didn't even really play in the last game. Sam Hauser was a key part of that team and it hit like half of his three pointers and it was just great off the bench. So I, I you know, I'm very high on both of them. Currently and in the future, I think Sam Hauser is going to have an even bigger weight lifted off the shoulder that he has this contract now. Um, I feel like for shooters and just for bench players in general, knowing that your financial future is secure, like it does take a load off. And Pritchard had that this past year, and you could see that it, it made things a little bit easier. Um, but he was he was my sixth man of the year pick. I was between the two, and I ended up on Pritchard, so I was worried I was going to steal your guy there. But I, I just I think there's room for both of them to grow. I am intrigued to see if the Celtics give Peyton Pritchard more ball handling opportunities. Cause for as much as he got last year, he was still largely like catch and shoot guy, get a stand deep behind the three point line, really space the floor and let guys drive inside. I I think giving Pritchard the ball more and letting him run more than just the second unit could do wonders for the Celtics team. I I'm, I know you love Pritchard too, but I I think he's so much better than even a lot of people realize in terms of his ability to organize the offense, create for himself. Obviously he's never going to be an amazing defender. He, he hustles, right? He tries, he's fine on that end. Um, I think he holds up better than people expect him to, but just being a small guard, you're never going to be, you know, this a plus tier defender, whatever. But, I think his ability to run the offense, make plays and create for himself and others um, should encourage Joe Missoula and the Celtics to give him more opportunities, especially considering like Gerard, he's 34. He's not going anywhere anytime soon, but like you never know any given day. Like if they win another championship, maybe Drew's like, all right, I want to spend time with my family. Right. And I'm not saying he's going to do that. He just signed an extension. It it sounds like he's going to be in Boston for a while, but I feel like elevating Peyton Pritchard and even like down the line, like Jaden Springer, like seeing what you got in him is a testament to, we want to keep make this more than just a three year window where we can win a title. We want to elevate these guys. And I think giving Pritchard more responsibilities next season could be a way to do that. So um, I, I think he could make another leap similar to hazard. And I do really hope, like you said, that this year during the regular season, like they do tap in, you know, Joe and, and the coaching staff do tap into some of those bench guys a little bit more and just, and I think they will just because you have a finals run in the Olympics under your belt, like, and, and through holiday, like you said, you know, played a lot of minutes. And so, yeah, I think, they, they both are a strong case to me. I think they're both going to improve and they're both going to 
play a really critical role for this Celtics team. Uh, even though there are other bench pieces that could jump in there, like I feel like those two guys now, they're pretty proven. Like it's not much of a question mark. You've seen them for an entire playoff run. Um, I love the way like Hauser bounced back from a bad shooting series and then had the final series that he had. I felt like that showed a lot about him as a person too. Like the fact that he was able to be so resilient and then on the brightest stage, like was so effective. But um, but yeah, okay, we're going to do, we got two more here. We got most improved and MVP. Um, I almost wanted to do co- coach of the year and like pick an assistant, but it's a little too We much. can. Do you want to? I um, want to. It's your show. You do whatever you want. Like, here's my thing though with the coaches and like I yeah. was on the big three podcast with uh, Sherrod and, and Gary and, and Kwani yesterday. And we, we were talking about like what, what we want to see from Joe and like what kind of improvements Missoula can make. And my thing with just talking about coaches, is I always struggle because I feel like it's so speculative, like what we yeah. actually know about the coaches. Like I know who's really nice from the assistant coaches. I know sure. who has some responsibilities and I know you did a lot of research on the assistants last year and like kind of the stories of how they got there, the player development coaches. Um, yeah. But I, I still feel like it's really hard to gauge like who is responsible for what strategically. Like we don't really even really know who the scouts were for each series. Like that has been not, that, that was not true. Disclosed. So that's my thing was like, I, I would love to be able to say like, this is going to be the coach. Um, but a lot of times it's just going off like vibes and you can pick up on stuff. I do think like you can yeah. pick up on Charles Lee and Drew Holiday's relationship just based on being there pregame and like how they were literally like this, you know, where they were. And, and you can pick up on the fact that um, Jermaine Buckner was clearly like really becoming more and more comfortable and had a bigger role. And like then later on in summer league, like I think DJ McClay said like he was the guy that grew the most and obviously got an assistant job. So you can pick up on little things, but it's just hard from our vantage point. I wish we had more access to like, watch practice and then we can say like, yeah. Oh, yeah this was happening but by the time we get to practice it's like who's who's participating in the trick shots drills with Derek White I love the trick shot drills though you won't hear me I complaining know. about that I I, I like watching I but yeah I mean what is your story on them it would be fun it would be, you said that last you said that in the playoffs last year you've been working on that story for months know, you, you've been really saying that <laughs> I know no, so the, cool. really the only that. access we have is like watching pregame and them. And that's really only the player development guys. So like we never really get to see like Sam Cassell as much or Emil Jefferson or half these guys do like a lot of the stuff they do. So it, it's a very small window. We get to watch them work with players. And I feel like that doesn't even come close to telling the whole story. So you, you just don't really know. I love going to events right now. It's football season. I love going to football games, concerts, um, really any events living in Boston. You can just put in any event into the game time app. And you can get the best prices guaranteed. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play live even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. So all you have to do is figure out what it is you want to attend. Uh, for example, I'm looking right now to get tickets for my family for opening night for the Celtics. So I can search that game in, browse through the seats on game time picks. Um, I can already see there's lots of great deals. There are super deals, uh, different tiers of deals. And, and basically as I'm looking, I'm able to actually see what the actual uh, perspective of the court is from that particular seat. I have to make sure I don't want to get them seats that are in the balcony that are too far away. I can see what the court view is going to look like um, from those seats. So that's that way I can, I'm able to choose without just looking at a seat number, which maybe doesn't mean anything to me. I'm able to see right away uh, that this is a seat that I want to buy for my family members for opening night so that they can see the ring ceremony and the banner raising and all that fun stuff. So game time picks makes curation much easier. It makes it easier to save more on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, et cetera. It's all in pricing. So you can you know use this feature uh, to see the total upfront price. So there's no fees at, at the checkout. So the price that it says is the price that it is. Uh, you get the panoramic view. You get a lowest price guarantee for game time. So you find a, a lower price elsewhere, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. And there's Game Time ticket coverage. So your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code CLNS for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. So we're going to do most improved next and i'll have you go first jack i think there was a lot of worthy candidates and i viewed it as more about opportunity like who i think will have opportunity to improve mm. um but I'll, I'll let you share your pick first listen anybody who listens to how about them celtics knows my answer for this if xavier tillman has 100 fans i'm one of them if xavier tillman has five fans i'm one of them if xavier tillman has one fan 
I'm him. If he has none, I'm dead. Right. Xavier Tillman stock. I'm buying it. I I, I love Xavier Tillman. I, I think he is. I don't think the Celtics could have found a better potential out Horford replacement in the NBA than Xavier Tillman. I think he is one of the most impressive switchable defenders they have on the roster already. I think his three point shot is real. And I think he's going to get a chance to show that off next season. I think he's going to get a ton of opportunities uh, with Chris Ops for Zingas out. And I think you already saw the start of that in the finals. Like they needed an extra bench guy. They didn't go to Canada. They didn't go to Cornette. They went to Xavier Tillman, right? Like they said, okay, this is the guy we're going to trust. This is the guy we're going to go to with KP out. He's going to be the next big up in the rotation. And Joe Mazzullo is so big on trust that I think he earned a lot of that in the finals. He earned a lot of that over the course of his small time with the Celtics. And so you give him an entire training camp. You give him his first full season in Boston after getting here at the trade deadline. I think he's going to be phenomenal next year uh, on offense and defense. And I think he's going to be a seamless fit. So give me all the Xavier Tillman stock in the world. I'm all, I'm all in. I need it. Is that how I'm supposed to say his name? Xavier? Xavier Tillman, Xavier Tillman. I'm not sure. I, I pronounce there's Xavier and there's Xavier. I, that's a good question. Let me let me go to basketball reference. That's I like could how be I realized wrong. I was saying Namish Keda wrong the entire season. Namish Keda. I was saying Namish. Says pronunciation Namish Xavier Tillman. You're right. It's just Xavier. It's just Xavier Tillman. Xavier. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Spoiler alert. Mine is Namish Keda. Is, is was he was my selection for this award. Um, there are other people that I think are going to improve a lot. I wanted to pick Jaden Springer because. I was really high on him from summer league. Um, I also just really like his game. I love guys like that, that are defensively minded guards that are clearly like going to, who would already be an elite NBA defender. Um, but just looking at the roster, I don't know that he's going to get an opportunity to showcase that improvement. Um, if he was on another team, I think I would, I would probably buy some of the stock, but I, I don't know that unless somebody gets really injured, like someone's out for extended period of time, um, which obviously I hope is not the case, then I don't know that James Springer is going to have that opportunity. On the flip side, like you said, you know, there's going to be an opportunity in the front court. And I do think that they're going to be very cautious with Porzingis coming back. And it, I was between like, between uh, thinking about the front court, I don't think Luke's going to make any jumps. Like I think Luke is Luke and he's what he is and it's great. And he plays his part well, but there's no reason to think like this year, he's going to make a massive leap. Uh, but then you have, you know, Namish Keita and you have David Tillman as the other two guys that are in the mix, you know, in that trio that re-signed to, to serve on the bench. Um, and I just think we really didn't see much with Nimi last year. Like he played, there was that road trip and, you know, around Christmas time that he was actually like a big contributor in, but the rest of the way, like he was just an extra body and, and, you know, played in blowouts um, and then played in Maine. He was really good in Maine, but I think that his skill set of just like him as a lob threat, the athleticism that he has, uh, the defensive potential that he has, and it really is potential at this point because we haven't seen it all come together to be like a really smart defender. Um, I think if he's able to stop fouling and to stay on the court and to give you 20 minutes, like people are going to be really surprised with what he can do. Uh, him and Tillman are kind of like opposite players, like in a way, like they're, what their skill sets are and what their strengths and weaknesses are. Like if you could combine them into one player, like his switchability, but then Nemea Cicada is like, Law, you know, ju- athleticism and jumping and rim protection, and all that. Like, if you could combine those two, you know, it wouldn't be a better minimum guy, which is who we have. Um, yeah. But I'm going with Nimi just because I watched, I watched a lot of him in Maine. I watched a lot of him in summer league, um, and I I feel optimistic that he's going to be able to be a real NBA level contributor. Um, but I'd be happy with either of those guys stepping up to the plate. So time will tell. Yeah, I said this recently on. How about them Celtics? I think Nimi has the biggest gap between his ceiling and floor next year. Not that not floor, not meaning like, I think he'll get worse, but like the floor is, he doesn't improve much. The floor is he like stays the same. His defensive instincts don't improve. His positioning is still off. He still fouls a lot. Still isn't screening without foul. Feeling is like, he just is his abilities, like composure. Like if he just stays in position on defense, if he just stays down, doesn't jump too early. If he can screen without fouling, like, He's a legitimate rotation center in the NBA. But again, that's why it's a ceiling and a floor. But I think the gap is so big. But I think that's a good pick. I think he's going to get just as many opportunities um, as anybody else behind uh, Porzingis. I think they'll probably split it up pretty evenly between Till and Kata, depending on matchup. So um, I'm excited to see what he does. Okay, so this is the grand finale of MVP. Um, I think we're going to disagree on this one, actually. The more We've disagreed on every single one so far. Mm. I've liked your picks. They've been like my runner-ups, but we haven't landed yeah. on any of the same ones, which is good. It makes for more interesting discourse. Um, why don't you go? I know what you're going to say. Tatum. 
Is yeah. that who you do? As you say, it's it feels so lame because it's just the obvious pick because everyone is like, oh, it's just Jason Tatum. Like that's the Celtics. But I, I truly think you could see Tatum improve even more than he did uh, year to year this upcoming season. And the biggest thing for me is something that Tyler Rucker of No Ceiling said to me and Sam right after the finals. He goes, I feel like the weight of winning a championship being off his shoulders is going to make him play so much differently than he has in years past. Like I feel like a lot of times this year and in years past, you've seen Tatum really press just in in very niche big moments right like he'll be like i gotta get the shot off i gotta do this i gotta yeah. do that like the pressure of knowing that he hadn't gotten over the hump when everyone thinks he should have I, I feel like was almost just in the back of his mind even if it wasn't a conscious feeling and, and decision it was like subconsciously eating at him a little bit and either that's gone like i like as stupid as it sounds like he cut his hair right he's back to whatever he's just like all right cool i can do whatever they want now like i i, pro- I don't have anything else to prove to anybody i'm just gonna be able to play free and so i don't even think it's gonna be like Oh, he's going to score 30 points. I think he's going to average like seven assists a game. I think his assists are going to go up. I think his rebounds are going to go up. I think he's going to lock in on the defensive end as well. If anything, I think his scoring numbers could go down and his efficiency goes up and he might take less threes. Like, I really think you're just going to see a more streamlined version of Jason Tatum that while he might not get the like MVP love that everyone wants him to have because his scoring numbers could go down, I think he's going to impact winning at a much higher level than he has before. And that's saying a lot considering how much he impacts winning. So I, I'm very high on this season as a streamlined version of Tatum in terms of his passing, rebounding, defense. Uh, and I think that's what's going to make him the MVP again because I think he has been for a while now. You make a good case, and I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, and I had him originally as my selection, and then I thought about him more. Um, this, this might be a bold claim, but I think Jalen Brown is going to have, mm. like, an insane year. Like, the, mm. the, the best basketball we've ever seen from him. Um, and I don't have that – this is like not even like basketball analysis because it's just hard. It's just all speculative right now. <laughs> Obviously, they're both great in the playoffs. Yeah. I don't have that feeling that Jason Tatum is going to come out and do anything different than what we've seen in the past. I-, I hope his shot's on. Like, that's the biggest thing. I would hate yeah. to have him go through like a season-long shooting struggle where now it's like he's just getting like Raymond Green guarded where like he's just giving him threes all of a sudden because he he's not far from that. If he starts to shoot poorly for a few weeks after everything, like I can see people starting to dare him too. And I... I- I don't think it would ever get to that point, but it, that, maybe I'm just, I, it would have I to go not. on for like another full season, I think. Cause ev- like for, for as bad as he was in the playoffs and team, you would say like, everyone knows station Tatum can shoot the ball. Like he's str- yeah. absolutely, he's streaky, but if you get the wrong side of the streak, like you, you can't take that risk. I feel like, and that was, that's what makes him so effective. And so yeah. I, I, I don't, I, mean, I can't see sub 30% from three on the year, like the way that he did in the playoffs with all yeah. the weapons you have on that Celtics team and see, his ability to drive and everything like, I can see people doing it just to mess with him a little bit. I don't like it, but I I, I even felt like when the Warriors did it to Jalen Brown, like I got what they were doing. Yeah. If, you, if you if you find something, you found something. Like watching Rondo get guarded, watching Russell Westbrook. I mean, seriously, watching Russell Westbrook get guarded, it's like it just it ruins everything for a team when he's on the court. He's thinking about it. He then he wants to show them that he can shoot, so he's taking bad shots that he wouldn't have even taken. I don't know. I'm just putting, I hope it's not the thing. I don't want to manifest that, but. Uh, no, I know what you mean. I, and I get it. But like, I feel like people are almost taking not you or not people. Cause I mean, I've talked to Sam a million times. Sam is as big of a Tatum shooting hater as you can get. It, I feel like people are making almost too big of a deal out of the slump at the playoffs. Cause I truly yeah. believe it was just like the worst possible time for something like Tatum's gone through 20 game stretches where he shoots 30%. Like that's, that's a normal yeah. thing. He did. Like I, I pulled up basketball reference and the first thing I saw November 17th to the end of December, he shot 30% from three on eight and a half attempts a game. Like it just happened to be the playoffs. And that sucks because it was a giant yeah. stage, but I, but I feel it like didn't really matter. exactly. And it didn't matter. And uh, for what it's worth, those 20 games that I'm 18 games, I mentioned where he shot 30%, he still shot 37.6% from three on the season. It was his best percentage since 2021. Like, I, I think it's yeah. almost getting overblown a little bit. And I think the team USA stuff, people are like, combining into that when that was a different situation where he was like playing a role that he was never used to and he was just completely like thrown off i don't know maybe i'm just like a tatum defender because as i've been accused by in the comments plenty of times but um I, i'm not i'm not taking too much stock into the tatum is a bad shooter thing yet i need to see if he continues like for the next month of the next season next x amount of games i'll be like all right yeah there's a problem now um and i'm not saying Jalen Brown's a bad pick for mvp like based on everything i said like I don't think it's a likely world just because I think the shots are going to be similar to what they were last year. I don't think they'll take that big of a difference, but I could see a world where Jalen Brown averages slightly more points or at least on par points with Jason Tatum. 
this year if Tatum wants to take a, a step back in the department. But I only question it because I don't know how much they're going to try to change actively what they did last year when it so clearly worked, right? Like for as much as yeah. like these little minutiae we're talking about, oh, change this, Tatum, take less threes, Jalen Brad, be more good, blah, blah, blah. Like they dominantly want a championship based on everything they did last year. And so I, I do think... Jalen Brown's a fair pick for MVP. I think he's going to have another great season. I think his playmaking is going to go up. I think he's going to lock in even more too. Um, I just don't know how much room for differentiating we can get in the scoring column. That's fair. I think, yeah, I think that's fair. The one piece that has influenced my decision, and I, I'll just say I totally agree with you on the shooting slump thing. I thought that it was, like we were discussing after every Olympic game, like we did a whole, you know, the garden report post game show and yeah. we're breaking down. And I was like, at certain points, like he was like, over two, like how, you know, like let's not over two doesn't really end of the world. Much. It's done. I also it's feel like because like not to bring up me playing basketball twice in one episode, but I also feel like because I've experienced it firsthand where it's like, it's not a mechanical thing. It's like literally just, do you have confidence or not? And I've seen my dad who was like literally the best three point shooter I've ever seen go through games where it's like all of a sudden he's over 10 and it's like, everybody, you know, if you were had like a media analysis, which sure there was back in the day when he played, like people would be like, Oh my God, what happened to shot? And it's like, you, I just, I find that whole, it's like my least favorite narrative about basketball is talking about people's shooting slumps and yeah. speculating and extrapolating and freaking out about it. When, 99% of the time people if they're a good shooter you bounce back from it right like how many times have we seen Al Horford be you know eulogized yeah. like the playoffs last year the 23 yeah, playoffs I mean, couldn't shoot <laughs> I remember for yeah 2024 I mean there was in the up at the first Both. two rounds he couldn't shoot yeah and then he turned it around completely mm-hmm. I remember 100%. in Cleveland he had missed like 20 in a row I know talking yeah. down um, bad but in any case I have Jalen because a I think that fair he's he won MVP of the finals and conference finals. So like, I'm just kind of going with with the flow of what we've seen of late, but also I think the Olympic thing is going to impact Jalen better than Jason um, for two reasons. One, because again, from my perspective, from covering them, it seems to me like Jalen Brown is somebody that has been more effective at harnessing rejection and frustration and actually being motivated by it. I haven't really seen that as much from Tatum. Like I don't, it doesn't seem like his personality as much. Um, Again, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that maybe we're not aware of, but that's the impression at least that has been available to us. Uh, and I also think that Jalen Brown didn't really get embarrassed this summer. Like he got a lot of fuel and attention and stuff, but he's gonna and he's gonna kind of be like, I want to prove all these people right that were with me, all these people wrong that work with me. Um, Tatum was actually in a, in a worse position in a sense. Not, obviously, he has a gold medal, and like in the long term, that's what's gonna matter. But from like a narratives like rejection standpoint like he was all of summer on espn with fa- zoom ups of his face sitting there on the bench and like that same jump shot that he missed off the side of the backboard getting replayed like i feel like that that can get to you more than just not making the team and everybody saying yeah. he should be on the team you know um and it just his personality so i'm going with jalen slight edge but i think they both probably have really good seasons um and mm-hmm. the main thing is like i feel like everybody's like so excited about the fact like, i feel like I keep seeing this dominant media narrative where i'm like Charles Barkley and people saying like, they're going to, you know, who's everybody's messing with Boston. They're going to go out and show them like, hopefully they don't go out and show them too much. Hopefully they just play basketball the way that they did last year. Cause if they start to have like a revenge yes. tour vibe, like it's probably not going to benefit the team too much. So um, anyways, those are our picks. So we had, I had Jalen Brown for MVP, Namish Keita for most improved, Sam Hauser for six man, Drew Holiday for defensive player, Derek White for clutch player. And you had literally all opposite picks. Yeah, we didn't agree on anything, which is probably good. I uh, know I had I had Tatum for MVP. I had um Xavier Tillman for most improved. I had Jalen for clutch player, Derek White for defensive player of the year, and Pritchard for six man. Right? I think that's all of them. I didn't name Tatum for anything. Yeah, you're a hater. I know. I hope right. I don't get any any death threats. So just saying, <laughs> that's only the WNBA. <laughs> I had to say it. I had to say it. Um, I actually am going to do a WNBA focused episode, not this one. Um, mm. But in that episode, I want to say everybody has been telling me, oh my gosh, you can't handle the WNBA coverage. Imagine if you covered an NBA team. And I just want to say shout out to Celtics fans because I haven't seen anything like this of Celtics fans. But um, no, that no. might be too ambiguous in a statement. I guess I'll just say I enjoyed covering Celtics fans. Last year. <laughs> Talking to Celtics fans, that's all. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, we'll probably have Jack back. Um, we'll see. Ooh. We'll see if he made the. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Uh, we'll see. <laughs> threshold <laughs> Um, no, we'll have Jack back. 
the you audience know, engagement just goes all the way down like no one i know imagine <laughs> i get like four views on this episode i'm putting your name in the in the subject line so we can really a b test no, it. No. um so we'll see um leave, leave a comment if you want to see jack back or not <laughs> no, just kidding i actually don't want to open the door for that or not no more online hate um okay jay thanks jack for for joining maybe i'll join your yep. podcast at some point of course um, of course we'll, we'll make it happen is there anything soon. you want to plug uh i'm on twitter jackson on nba i feel like i'm doing that how about them celtics out right now uh how about them celtics is my podcast and my written works at harvard TV, but that's that's it thank you thanks for having me this is fun thanks for joining have a good one everyone we'll, we'll i'll be back on sunday we'll do a live episode again so 